history. <clears throat> And uh, we talked also about solutions. Uh, again, a solution is made up of two parts, the solute and the solvent. The solute is the smaller part of the solution. Uh, the solvent is the larger part of the solution. And typically speaking, to make a solution, uh, we dissolve the solute in the solvent. And solutions are homogeneous mixtures that have the aqueous sort of symbol next to them. Uh, one of the important concentration units of solutions is molarity, which is moles of solute per liter of solution. And um, we could rearrange this equation to solve for moles, which is very commonly done, liters times molarity. Uh, we also can solve for liters, which would be moles divided by molarity. So really important to know how to rearrange those formulas. Uh, we also talked, I think, about dilution. And when we do a dilution, uh, we basically are taking a solution that's more concentrated and adding more solvent, which will lower the concentration. And it does so because when we add more solvent, we're really adding more of the bottom part here. And that's going to make obviously our molarity be much smaller. And there is a dilution equation that's typically used M1V1 equals M2V2. Uh, and this is usually your concentration and volume of the more concentrated solution. And this is your more dilute solution. Remember that when you solve for V1, it typically is the volume of the more concentrated solution that you need to dilute down. V2 is your final volume of your diluted solution, which has a lower concentration. And oftentimes in dilution problems, they will ask something like how much water sort of added or how much solvent is added. And typically speaking, you take V2 minus V1, and that will give you how much water or solvent that you added. There's a more generic version of this equation, which is C1V1 equals C2V2, uh, where C is just generic for concentration on both sides. And that means in most cases, molarity is very much the most common one that we come across. Uh, but you can use any type of sort of concentration unit there. So, for example, you can use percent mass of mass, percent mass of volume on each side as long as they are the same. Uh, this is also one of the uh, only equations that I would recommend if you wanted to. You can leave the volume in milliliters, uh, and it will work out if both of the volumes are in milliliters. They will cancel out correctly, and you'll be back to molarity. Um, or if you're solving for a volume where one of them is in milliliters, uh, you'll end up with milliliters as your answer. So that's okay, not okay to leave it in milliliters in this situation if you're just using uh, molarity and volume together to get the moles because you will get, again, millimoles rather than moles, which is what you think, and you'll be off by a factor of a 1,000. So uh, molarity by itself, and you need to use volume, you should convert it to liters. But if you are using a dilution equation, you can't leave it in milliliters, it will be okay. We finished up talking about titrations as we're in the middle of that experiment as well. And when we do a titration and problems, it really is solution stoichiometry. And the good news about solution stoichiometry is really it's the same four steps. You still need a balanced equation. Uh, you still need to convert to moles. Uh, you do need to do the mole to mole relationship. Uh, you do need to then convert those moles to some other unit. Also, somewhere along the way, you should determine whether or not it's a limiting reagent type problem, uh, which it could be. The main difference usually in these type of problems is how we get to the moles. So step number two, a lot of times we do grams to moles using the molar mass. But most of the time for using something with... Uh, solutions, uh, we will use this formula right here instead, and we would use the liters and the molarity to get to moles. Uh, the rest of the calculation is kind of very similar. Also at the end, instead of maybe going from moles back to grams using the molar mass, we oftentimes will use molarity at the end here. Either we will uh, solve for molarity or you will use the uh, molarity in the moles to figure out the volume as well. So 
Um, one of those two endings is very common in titration problems or solution stoichiometry problems um, <clears throat> based on, uh, you know, sort of what we end up with. Any questions on any of that stuff there that we talked about last time? So we did a titration problem last time. Let's do another one here just to make sure. Let's do, um, what is the molarity of, Hundred and twenty five milliliters of calcium hydroxide if it requires sixty five milliliters of nitric acid, a uh, zero point and we'll do five five zero molar nitric acid to reach the equivalence point. And a titration. All right, so give it a go here. We're looking for the molarity of the calcium hydroxide. It requires 125 milliliters of calcium hydroxide uh, to reach the equivalence point when it reacts with 65 milliliters of 0.55 molar. I'll do it as well since I just made it up, but we'll hope for the best here. Problem. So we need an equation. We have our nitric acid, which obviously is an acid. We're going to react with calcium hydroxide, which is a base. Going to do a double displacement reaction. So that's going to make water there. And that's going to make some calcium nitrate. Uh, so we'll get some H2O plus some calcium uh, nitrate here. Again, we want to make sure we get the right formulas down. Now that we have the right formulas down, we want to balance it. Uh, so it looks like we will need a two there. And I think maybe a two there. And now I think we might be good. Uh, so that's six, eight oxygens, eight oxygens, nitrogen. So we're good at that point. Any questions on that equation there? <clears throat> All right, now that we have that, uh, let's see what we're looking for here. We're looking for the molarity of our calcium hydroxide. Bless you. Uh, we do know the volume is 125 milliliters. Um, we have 65 milliliters of our 0.5 molar nitric acid. So this is not a limiting reagent problem as we can only get moles from this guy. Here, obviously, we're looking for the molarity, so it clearly it's just a basic stoichiometry problem. When we look at the molarity for the calcium hydroxide, uh, we actually do have the volume. Um, so the thing that we're missing to get us to molarity for it is the moles of calcium hydroxide. So this is where the stoichiometry part will come into play. We have our balanced equation. Next thing we want to do is really convert to moles. And in this case, we're going to use, again, our volume and molarity to do so. We can take our molarity and convert it into both units. So we could see them both, which is our moles per liter. That also means that we do need to convert our milliliters into liters in this case so that everything works out correctly in terms of units. Now that we have that, we'll go with uh, 0 0.065 liters. We're going to times it by the molarity here. The liters of nitric acid will cancel, and that will get us 0 0.065 times 0 0.550, 0 0.03575 moles of nitric acid. Any questions so far? <clears throat> At this point, it is uh, pretty much a basic stoichiometry problem. So we're going to go from moles of our nitric acid to moles of our calcium hydroxide. And from the equation, we can see for every two moles of nitric acid, we have one mole of calcium hydroxide. So that is what we're going to use to convert. Since we are looking for the moles of calcium hydroxide, so one mole of that will go up on top. 
and two moles of the nitric acid will go on the bottom. The moles of nitric acid will cancel. We're going to divide by two in this case. It's going to give us 0 0.01788 moles of calcium hydroxide. Now that we use the stoichiometry here to get to the moles of calcium hydroxide, that really is sort of the thing that we were missing to calculate the molarity. So we're going to take the moles of calcium hydroxide and we're going to take the volume of it, which also needs to be converted to liters. So 125 milliliters divided by 1,000 gets us 0 0.125 liters. So our molarity of our calcium hydroxide, 0 0.01788 moles divided by 0 0.125 liters. Going to give us a molarity of 0.143. Again, you can leave it as moles per liter, or you can put the big M back in at this point of calcium hydroxide. Any questions on any of those steps? This is basically uh, step number uh, four here, except as you use molar mass, we're going to use actually the molarity equation on the back end of the calculation. Any questions on any of those steps or titration problems, anything like that. So really, again, same steps, just difference is using molarity and volume uh, to get the moles, and at the end, a lot of times you might be calculating the molarity or using the molarity that's given to you to calculate the volume. Any questions on any of that there? <clears throat> All right, then let's go back and talk about another sort of solution stoichiometry problem. We kind of skipped it, I think, earlier, maybe. So gravimetric analysis is another sort of uh, procedure that is used uh, with solutions. And a lot of times it's used for precipitation reactions. And in these type of reactions, we can mix together, for example, two solutions and it will form a solid. Once that solid is formed, we could actually use a process of filtration like we see here. This is what's known as a Buchner funnel suction filtration, you pour in all that white solid liquid, liquid's gonna come through. Uh, your white precipitate there will remain on the funnel. Uh, you could let the filter paper dry and figure out how much product you actually produced in that case. Uh, that would be your like, for example, actual yield. You could also calculate like your theoretical yield based on how much you start with. So sometimes these type of problems come about uh, where uh, we're doing a precipitation reaction, but also involves some solutions. So for example, if we mix together, if we mixed, we'll do uh, 115 milliliters of 0 0.5 molar sodium chloride with I'll do, uh, yeah, we'll do 95 milliliters of 0 0.85 molar lead to nitrate. How many grams of lead to chloride would be produced? All right, so why don't you give it a try and see what you come up with. Again, we need an equation. Give me some numbers. Lead is uh, 207. Nine, uh, garbage, 207. CL is 35.45. To start with the equation, figure out how much product you're going to produce. Okay, let's take a look and see. So clearly, uh, this is a stoichiometry problem. So we will need an equation. So we're going to take some sodium chloride. 
going to react it with some lead to nitrate. You should be able to again recognize this as a double displacement reaction where our positive guys are going to switch partners. This is going to get us on the right-hand side here, NaNO3 and a little PbCl2 in this case, which would be our solid based on solubility rules as chlorides are soluble in everything except for silver, lead, and mercury. So that's an exception. We would want to balance it. So probably a two there and a two there will balance it as well. <clears throat> Any questions on the equation? At this point, we want to kind of analyze what we got going on in terms of information. So here we have 115 milliliters of 0 0.5 molar. We also have 95 milliliters of 0 0.85 molar. So is this a limiting reagent problem? This actually is a limiting reagent problem because... You could get to the moles of this guy, and you could get to the moles of that guy as well. So that's the big clue that it is a limiting reagent problem. So you do need to solve for the limiting reagent and figure out which one it is. Once again, here we can do the ice table approach if you like to do that. The difference is in this case, how we're getting the moles. Uh, we're going to use obviously the volume and the molarity here to do that. Uh, so we do have to convert, once again, our milliliters into liters by dividing by 1,000. So our moles of sodium chloride uh, would be 0 0.115 liters times in it by its molarity of 0.5 moles per liter. <clears throat> That's going to get us 0.115 times 0 0.5, 0 0.0575 moles. We'll do the same thing for our lead to nitrate. Dividing this 95 by 1,000 gets us 0 0.095 liters, times in it by its molarity of 0.85 moles per liter. 0 0.095 times 0 0.85, 0 0.0808 moles. So I'm going to do the ice table here, which is kind of how we were looking at doing these problems. Once again, you can do it other ways that we discussed, if you like that way better. So going into our uh, table here, initially we have uh, 0.0575 moles. For our lead there, we got 0 0.0808 moles zero and zero. Change will be minus 2x. Remember, you do need to take the coefficient into account, otherwise you have the wrong mole to mole relationship. Minus x plus 2x because coefficient is two and plus x as the coefficient there is one. Here, at the end here, we would have 0 0.0575 minus 2x, 0 0.0808 minus x, 2x and x. Any question on the table here? <laughs> Remember at this point, this is where we can figure out which one's the limiting reagent by setting our reactants equal to zero and solving for X. So if we do this, that X is 0 0.0808 moles. We set this guy equal to zero. That gives us two X is equal to 0 0.0575, which means in this case, X 0 0.0575 divided by 2 equals 0 0.0288 moles. It is, again, the smaller X value. That is the limiting reagent. So that means in this case, in my made-up example, the sodium chlorides are limiting reagent and the lead to nitrates are excess reagent. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Remember that now that we know what the limiting reagent is and we know the X value, we could jump right to what we're looking for, which happens to be this guy right here. And we can see that at the end, the moles of 
PBCL2 equals X, which means we have 0 0.0288 moles of PBCL2. We can convert that into grams by using the molar mass here. So that's going to be 207.2 plus 2 times 3545. Looks like 207.2 plus 2 times 3545, about 278.1 grams per mole. So we'll use that as our last step here, 278.1 grams up on top, moles on the bottom so that we end up with grams. And that will get us about 8.01 grams of lead to chloride would be produced in this case. And that would be your theoretical yield as it is a product. Again, if we were also interested in sodium chlor uh, sodium nitrate, uh, we could also throw it back into here and figure out. We could also, again, throw it back into here to figure out how much of that excess reagent would be left over. So sometimes you do run across uh, solution stoichiometry that is still a limiting reagent problem. So whenever you're doing any type of stoichiometry, basic stoichiometry with grams and moles, molarity and volume, as we'll talk about with gases as well, you always want to keep in your mind, is it a limiting reagent problem or not? And again, the way you determine that is, can you get to moles of each reactant? And if the answer is yes, then you do need to find a limiting reagent. Any questions on any of that there, or stoichiometry in general? All right, then let's finish up this chapter talking about our this little lectures here packet talking about some other types of concentration units. So we talked about molarity, which obviously is probably the most common unit of concentration, but there is also others. And another very common unit of concentration that sometimes comes about is what's referred to as percent mass to mass, sort of a percentage type of concentration unit. It is sometimes abbreviated percent M slash M, and that means basically mass to mass percent. And that is calculated by taking the mass of the solute divided by the mass of the solution and times it by 100%. The key part of this one is actually the bottom part, and that is the mass of the solution. You do want to make sure that you actually get the entire mass of the solution and not just the solvent. And the reason that sometimes will happen in these type of problems is, is very common. They will give you that information separate from each other. So they'll give you like the mass of the solute. They'll give you the mass of the solvent. And a lot of times a very common error that people make is uh, they'll just take the solvent because it's like the larger number. So you got to really make sure that you do get the mass of the entire solution. If you have a 4.5% by mass solution, of sodium chloride. What that means is sometimes you might want to turn it into a usable conversion factor. And whenever we have percentages, probably an easy way to turn it into a conversion factor is to assume 100. And what that would mean is you have 4.5 grams of sodium chloride in 100 grams of solution. And you could use it as a conversion factor. So if you needed to, you could flip it around the other way. 100 grams of solution is 4.5 grams of sodium chloride. So sometimes you are given the percentage and an easy way to kind of use it is to just convert it into like a conversion factor. In addition to percent mass to mass, there's a couple of other percent concentration units that you sometimes come across. There is percent volume to volume, like in alcohol. That is the volume of solute divided by the volume of solution times 100%. It's kind of milliliters over milliliters as the mass to mass is kind of grams over grams. Uh, there's also percent mass to volume, uh, which is the mass of the solute divided by the volume of solution times 100% kind of like density, like grams over milliliters in this case. So those are two very common units of 
percent concentrations. So if you had uh, your 4.5% by volume, sodium chloride, what that would mean is you have 4.5 milliliters of sodium chloride and 100 milliliters of solution. And obviously you can flip it around and use it as a conversion factor the other way. If you had 4.5% mass to volume sodium chloride, that would mean you have 4.5 grams of sodium chloride and 100 milliliters of solution, kind of like a density value, grams per milliliter. It's kind of that sort of deal. So again, that's how sort of all those percentages work. You could obviously plug and chug into any of those equations and solve for which missing. I would say out of all three of those, it really is the percent mass to mass is the one you really have to be careful of because usually in a problem, you're given the uh, volume of the solution. Uh, so you don't usually are given a lot of times the solute and the solvent separate and with volume. So that usually doesn't worry too much about that. Any questions on any of those there? <clears throat> all right, so I want you to try one here. A sample is prepared by mixing 2.5 grams of calcium chloride with 50 grams of water. Calculate the mass percent of calcium chloride in the solution. Okay, so on this one, uh, we're looking for the percent mass to mass, which is the mass of the solute divided by the mass of the solution times 100%. In this case, the calcium chloride is our solute as it's the smaller part. Our water here is our solvent. So that is the mass of our solute. Uh, once again, we do need to add both of those together there to get the mass of the solution. So in this case, we would take 2.5 grams divided by 52.5. Again, not just 50 times it by 100%. And in this case, we will end up with 2.5 divided by 52.5 times 100, 4.76%. And you can leave it M slash M calcium chloride, if you like. Any questions on that one there? <clears throat> All right, so why don't you try another one then and see what you come up with here. So uh, concentrated hydrochloric acid contains 37.2% by mass HCl. What is the mass of HCl that's contained in 35.5 grams of this? All right, so we are looking here at percent mass to mass, which is our mass of solute over mass of solution times 100%. Uh, we could just plug and chug into here as we do have the percent and we do have the mass of the solution. So we can solve for the mass of the solute. Uh, we could also turn that percentage that was given to us into a conversion factor. And basically what that means is we have 37.2 grams of HCl and 100 grams of solution. R in 100 grams of solution, we have 37.2 grams of HCl. So if we have uh, 35.5 grams of the solution, we could use the conversion factor on the left there, and that will give us 100 grams of solution is 37.2 grams of HCl. That's really the same math as if we just plugged it in here to our left. All right, and we will end up with 35.5 times 37.2 divided by 100. That's going to give us 13.2 uh, grams of HCl in this case. Any questions on that there? So once again, that's basically the same math as if you did the mass of the solute would equal the mass of the solution times the percent mass to mass divided by 100%, which is essentially what we just did there. Any question on percent mass to mass concentrations? <clears throat> All right.
Now, another uh, unit that sometimes comes about, and we will definitely see it a little bit later on in a, a later chapter, is molality. And it should not be confused with molarity, which is capital M. Uh, molality is actually lowercase m, not mass, but it is molality. And that is the moles of solute over the kilogram of solvent. And once again, molarity, which is big M, is moles of solute over liters of solution. The one that ties basically both of these together is density. So if you ever kind of, kind of cruise from one to the other, uh, the density is sort of the thing that ties them together and how you could kind of go from one to the next. So uh, the moles, pretty simple. Grams of moles using the molar mass in most cases. Kilograms of solvent here. Um, again, you just want the solvent part, not the solution in this one. So why don't you try one here? Calculate the molality of a solution prepared by dissolving 61.7 grams of C3H7OH in 175 milliliters of water. So let's take a look. Uh, molality, again, is our mole per kilogram of solvent. In this case, the water is our solvent. And obviously here, uh, this guy is our solute. So we do need to convert it into moles. So we have the grams of C3H7OH. Going to the periodic table and adding everything together. Gets us a 60.09 grams per mole. So we'll take uh, 61.7 divided by 60.09. Going to give us uh, 1.03 moles. Now to get to kilograms of solvent, in this case, we have the volume of water. We have the density of water. And that means that density is mass divided by volume, uh, which means the mass here would be our volume times our density. So we'll take our 175 milliliters of water times it by the density of water, which is one gram per milliliter. It means we have 175 grams of water, but we do need it in kilograms. So there are 1,000 grams in one kilogram. And that's going to give us 0 0.175 kilograms. So to find the molality here, we will take our moles. We will divide it by our kilograms of solvent. And we'll take 1.03 divided by 0.175. Again, the units are not going to cancel out here. So we'll end up with uh, 5.89 moles per kilogram. That's how you can leave it. Or if you want, just like molarity, uh, you could put the little m uh, here as the sort of answer. So just like kind of put the big M as well. Question on molality. So that's very common as well with molality. Sometimes you do use the density of the solvent to get to the grams because they give it to you in volume. Questions on molality here. <clears throat> we will use it a lot. Uh, in a later chapter when we talk about colligative properties. Uh, so we do use molality a lot, a little bit later on. <clears throat> Another thing that we'll use in the next chapter and also one coming up is mole fraction. Uh, mole fraction is the component of a solution uh, that's basically uh, kind of like a percentage without multiplying by a hundred. So uh, it is basically the moles that you're interested in uh, divided by the total moles that are present, and it's represented by an X. So if you were going to figure out the mole fraction of A, you would take the moles of A, and you would divide it by the total moles there are in that solution, our mixture, and you just don't times it by 100. Uh, so the maximum would be one when you add up all the mole fractions together, because that's basically 100% when you don't times it by 100. Um, and again, if you had moles of B, you would take moles of B divided by the total moles as well. And if there was only A and B in there, the moles of A plus the moles of B should equal one, which is basically 100% of the moles that are there.
All right, so why don't you give this last example here a go and see. Calculate the mole fraction of methyl alcohol in a solution that's composed of 0.328 moles of methanol and 0.929 moles of ethyl alcohol. See what you come up with. So we are looking for the mole fraction here of methanol, which is this guy, which means we would want the moles of methanol uh, divided by the total moles here. In this case, they're already in moles, but you might have to convert, obviously, grams to moles using the molar mass like normal. Uh, it's a very common way. So to get to the total moles, we're just going to add up everybody here. That's going to be 0.929 moles plus 0 0.328 moles. And... <clears throat> going to give us uh, 1.257. So our mole fraction of our methanol will be the moles of just the methanol in this case, which is 0 0.328 divided by 1.257. Once again, here, we're not going to multiply by 100 or anything like that. So 328 divided by 1.257 is going to give us a mole fraction of about 0.26. Uh, we'll call it one. <clears throat> if we wanted the mole fraction for ethanol, we could really do one of two things. We could do the same type of calculation, just take 0.29 moles divided by 1.257, and that would get us our mole fraction here of our other component, uh, which would be about 73%, basically. Alternatively, because these are the only two components, we could take one minus 0 0.261, and that would get us our mole fraction by going that way. It's basically taking it from 100% in this case. Question on mole fraction, which we will also see in gases coming up, and also later on in colligative properties when we talk about some of those things. Question on any of those things there. <clears throat> All right, then we are off to the next chapter, which is gases. So we're going to talk about some gases. And Okay, so next thing we're going to talk about is gases and a bunch of gas laws, some of which maybe you've seen before, some which you maybe not have seen before. And we'll cover it all, I think. So obviously we are into the gas stage here, and that is obviously the state of matter where everybody is basically broken apart from one another. They're flying around. And as they're flying around, they're causing collisions. And it's the number of collisions that occur with, for example, the gas molecules in the container uh, that assert the pressure that we associate with gases. So the more collisions, the higher the pressure, the less collisions that occur, the lower the pressure that we got going on. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about substances that exist as gases under normal conditions. So when we talk about sort of normal conditions, that's kind of everyday conditions. And usually that means a temperature that's sort of considered normal temperature, uh, which is 25 degrees Celsius, and a pressure, which is referred to as one atmosphere. So an ATM does refer to a unit of pressure. Under normal conditions, ionic compounds do not usually exist as gases, uh, things like, say, sodium chloride and things of that nature. And that is because... Ionic compounds are held together by really strong intramolecular forces like our electrostatic attraction, which is a fancy word for positive and negative attraction. And that's pretty much how an ionic solid is put together in a very organized fashion of all the positive ions, negative ions attracted to each other, arranging themselves in a way in which they maximize the attractive forces and minimize the repulsion type forces. And to overcome that really strong intramolecular force uh, is pretty hard to do under normal conditions. So you could heat the crap out of it and it pretty much will just start to melt rather than go into the gas phase. Uh, again, kind of similar to some of those earlier experiments where we evaporated off all that water in those evaporating dishes. And if you left it up there heating, uh, it never evaporated away. It just kind of looked like maybe it would start to melt. And that's sort of what's happening at that point. And that's because that's probably one of the strongest attractive forces that you could have uh, is that electrostatic attraction between the positive and negative ions together. 
And that is very different behavior than what we see with molecular compounds, which are pretty much guys that are sharing electrons and covalently bonding. Uh, a lot of molecular compounds just right out of the box are gases, things like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, hydrogen chloride gas, ammonia, and methane. Uh, but the one major difference between sort of a molecular compound and an ionic compound is it is much, much easier to convert a molecular compound into a gas than it is an ionic compound. And probably the easiest example that we're all probably familiar with is water. Water under normal conditions is a liquid and water is a polar molecule where the hydrogen is more positive than the oxygen. So when you have two water molecules, for example, together in the liquid phase, the negative side of one is attracted to the positive side of the other. And this bond between hydrogen and oxygen here is what is referred to as a hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonding is an example of what is referred to as an intermolecular force. And an intermolecular force is a force that holds basically one molecule together with another. And all intermolecular forces are pretty much the basic attraction of the positive side of one molecule is attracted to the negative side of another is pretty much how they are held together. And for example, if we took one water molecule, this one individual water molecule, the bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen where they are sharing electrons covalently bonded together, uh, that is an intramolecular force within the molecule. And those intramolecular forces, much like ionic bonding, are always much stronger than intermolecular forces. And we know this just by a simple example. If you ever boiled water, which I'm assuming you have since you're in the chemistry class, uh, when you start to boil and you reach the boiling point, it is actually the bond between the different water molecules that actually breaks first, that intermolecular force that allows this water molecule and this water molecule to go off into the gas phase, basically. If it was the other way around and the intramolecular force was weaker, when you would go to heat something like water, all the individual bonds would break and you get hydrogen gas, oxygen gas, which would not be good. So that doesn't happen because they're much stronger. So molecular compounds, the way they're basically held together with other molecular compounds, in sort of the liquid phase, for example, is through these intermolecular forces and doesn't take a tremendous amount of energy, for example, to break some of these forces. Like we see with water, we just need to get it up to about 100 degrees Celsius and it will start to boil and start breaking these bonds and letting these water molecules go off into the gas phase. So the general rule is that the stronger the attractive forces between one molecule and another, the less likely it will exist as a gas under normal conditions. Uh, that's also why, for example, something like methane, which is pretty much what comes out when you light your Bunsen burner, the gas. Uh, methane is nonpolar, as you might remember from bonding, as that is a nonpolar bond all the way around. And a nonpolar molecule like this actually uses what is referred to as dispersion forces or its intermolecular forces. And dispersion forces are pretty much the weakest forces that you could have. They're really temporary type forces that just happen upon a molecule. And that's because a nonpolar molecule normally has no sort of charge. There's no separation charge because the electrons are being shared equally over the entire molecule. So there's no area where all the electrons are hanging out that's more negative versus a side that's more positive. So in order for a nonpolar molecule to basically interact with something, it needs its electrons to sort of move one way or the other just randomly to happen. And that does happen and it temporarily gets a charge where it could temporarily start interacting with others, but it's a very temporary charge that will kind of break apart, new ones will form, break apart, new ones will form. And that's different than something like a polar molecule, which no matter what you do to it, will always have a positive side and negative side which means it's always good to go in terms of interacting with other molecules. It doesn't have to wait for something to happen for it to interact. And that's why something like methane 
is typically a gas at normal temperatures because you just look at it and it's going to go into the gas phase or be in the gas phase. And a lot of organic molecules are like that, especially the early ones, things like methane, propane, butane, those are all gases and very flammable. Also why when you take organic chemistry, if you do, uh, they usually stick you in a fume hood because a lot of organic molecules are nonpolar and they can jump into the gas phase relatively easy without a lot of effort. And since the hair not great to inhale and also very flammable, a lot of them, that's why they stick in a fume hood when you're working with those things so that you don't set the place on fire. Now, what are some substances that do exist as gases under normal conditions? Uh, again, our diatomic molecules, our elements, are hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine. Uh, those are all, again, come as twos as diatomic molecules and gases. Something like ozone, which is O3, is also a gas. And of course, our noble gases, which are group eight, are helium, our neon, argon, krypton, all the ons there. They come as ones, which are sometimes referred to as being monoatomic. So they do come as ones um, rather than our diatomic elements. So again, these guys in blue are guys under normal conditions we would expect to be gases. So let's talk a little bit about some of the characteristics of gases. Uh, gases assume pretty much the volume and shape of their containers that they are in. Uh, a lot of times we assume sort of ideal conditions and an ideal gas, as we'll talk about. And one of the main things that makes something sort of an ideal gas is pretty much that, that the volume of the gas itself is negligible, is not that important versus the volume of the container it's flying in, since we assume that's filling that container uniformly and flying around. So a lot of times when you look at problems, especially under ideal conditions, which is most of the time what you're looking at, uh, they oftentimes will talk about the container that the gas is in rather than the volume of the gas itself. And that's, again, one of those things that kind of makes something an ideal gas. Gases are the most compressible state of matter. Gases will mix evenly and completely when they're in the same container. One of the other things that we'll talk about as we go through this chapter that makes something an ideal gas is the idea that you really could have multiple gases in the same container and it's almost like they're in there by themselves. There will be kind of no interaction between different gases. Uh, and that's why we can do some things with partial pressures that we do under ideal conditions. So under kind of ideal conditions, there's really no repulsive forces or attractive forces between different gas molecules. And again, it could almost, even though there might be multiple gas molecules in a container, it's oftentimes assumed that they're not interacting with one another. And again, like they're almost in there by themselves. Typically, gases have much lower densities than liquids and solids. And as we'll talk about calculating the density of gases, typically when we calculate the density of gases, it's usually in grams per liter uh, versus grams per milliliter, which is typically what we see with liquids and solids. So obviously one of the important things that we measure with uh, gases is pressure. And there's several different types of units. Uh, there's pascals, uh, there's kilopascals, and uh, there's things like bar, uh, there's things like PSI, which is pounds per square inch. But I would say probably the big three in terms of units in most chemistry classes are pretty much these three guys right here. And that is one atmosphere is equal to 760 mmHg, and that equals 760 tor. And this is a barometer, a classic barometer, which we no longer have anymore in most schools that you go to because they are typically made with mercury. And typically a classic barometer is a pool of mercury with a glass tube kind of on it. And as atmospheric pressure kind of presses down on our barometer, the mercury rises, as the old saying is, and it goes up the tube there. Mercury is kind of unusual substance. Most substances, when we look at the meniscus, has a U-shaped meniscus. Mercury actually has the opposite way. Its meniscus actually goes in the opposite direction. And that is because the attractive forces between mercury and itself is much stronger than the attractive forces between mercury and the glass tube. So it actually comes in on itself rather than climbs up the walls like most things like water does, which makes the U. And we would read it actually if it was mercury, 
you would actually read it from the top there of the meniscus rather than obviously the bottom uh, like we do when it goes the opposite way. So that is really what this unit is. That is millimeters of mercury, right, is what the MM stands for. And that's because on a classic barometer, there usually was like a ruler. And a lot of times you could read the ruler in inches of mercury, uh, centimeters of mercury, and obviously millimeters of mercury, which is a very common sort of unit. A tor is named after the guy who invented the barometer. And those two units is a one-to-one -one relationship. So one millimeter of mercury is the same thing as one tor. So if you have to convert between those units, you essentially just change the units. The number stays the same. But 760 is an important number. That is the number that we use to convert between atmospheres and millimeters of mercury or tor. So if you have atmospheres and you want millimeters of mercury or tor, which is the same thing, you can multiply by 760. And that will get you your millimeters of mercury. And if you have millimeters of mercury or tor, you want to divide by 760 to get to atmospheres. I would say, again, probably those three are the most common units that will come across. Um, some of the other ones may pop up. Uh, kilopascal is 101.3 kilopascals in an atmosphere. A bar is about 101 bar to an atmosphere. They're almost pretty close to each other in terms of conversions. But those three are, again, definitely the, the ones that we see the most. Here you can see as we kind of climb up uh, from sea level, the pressure starts to decrease. And uh, again, why they pressurize planes, right, as you're flying around. When we look at gas laws, which we're going to look at, there's a few different variables that we kind of deal with, and that is pressure, volume, and temperature. So those are the three sort of variables that we deal with a lot. And in a lot of cases, we will kind of vary two of them and keep one of them constant. Uh, this is an apparatus that's used to measure, for example, the pressure of gases. And in this case, this is in a vacuum, it's closed off at the top, uh, which means that as the gas comes through the tube, it will push on the mercury and you can actually measure the height of the mercury in the column. And that will give you the pressure of the gas. And in this case, because it is close to the atmosphere, uh, you don't have to take that into account. In this case, this uh, monometer is open to the atmosphere. Uh, which means you do have some atmospheric pressure pushing back down on it. And in this case, when you want to figure out the pressure of the gas, it's actually the combination of the atmospheric pressure plus the pressure of the gas in the column to do so. Uh, and again, the difference is obviously you got to take atmospheric pressure into account on the right there where you don't in a vacuum there on the left. So the first sort of relationship that we're going to look at is looking at the relationship uh, from Boyle and Boyle's law. And he looked at pressure and volume, and he kept temperature constant. And what he basically saw was there is a relationship that when you see the pressure start to increase, you will see the volume start to decrease. And that does make sense if you just think about it logically, if you lower the volume, the gas molecules have a much smaller area to fly around in, which means the number of collisions are going to start to increase. And because the number of collisions will start to increase, so will the pressure as a result of that. He also saw the opposite is true. As the pressure starts to go down, the volume starts to go up. And if you increase the volume, you give everybody a lot more room to fly around in, which means the number of collisions will start to decrease and we will start to see the pressure go down. And that's what we see here at a large volume. Uh, we have a much smaller pressure and at a smaller uh, volume there. We have a much larger pressure there in the column. So as one goes up, the other goes down is Boyle's law relationship. He also discovered that if you take any pressure times volume measurement that you do for a particular gas at constant temperature, 
it always ends up at the same number, which is sometimes referred to as a proportionality constant. So you could take a bunch of pressure and volume measurements for a particular gas at the same temperature, and every time you multiply them together, you will get the same number. And that's important for sort of Boyle's law relationship, which means we can get to Boyle's law, which is this guy. And because you get that constant number, you can basically set it together for two different types of conditions. We have our P1 V1 equals P2 V2. In this case, the pressure doesn't matter as long as it's the same pressure on both sides, the units. The volume doesn't matter as long as they're the same units on both sides, so everything cancels out. And that's what we see here, lower volume, much higher pressure, uh, bigger volume gives everybody more room to kind of spread out. We see a much lower pressure that's going to happen. Any questions on that there? All right, I think we will lay it up there for today.